Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you'll probably picked up already, I'm Irish as well, so finishing off your first day with two Irish speakers, I don't know if it's a risk or if it's just been well planned, but um, I've lived in Orkney for uh, 28 years and I spent four years of my life here in Edinburgh at the University, so I spent more than half of my life in Scotland, but I'm still an Irishman. And you'll know that if you were in our house next Saturday watching the rugby. Um, but um, I'm speaking today on, on behalf of COSLA, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, the umbrella organisation for local authorities in Scotland. And uh, my portfolio as the Development, Economy and Sustainability spokesperson covers a whole wide uh, range of topic, topics and of really interesting issues um, from uh, development to the environment, renewable energy, transport, etc., etc. But within this particular remit, uh, climate change and Scotland's ambitious carbon reduction targets play a very key role. As we all know, global warming uh, due to increasing carbon emission is a very clear threat, both at global and at local levels. Reducing these carbon emissions through a transition to a low carbon economy is imperative if we are to safeguard a future for our children and for generations to come. Now, from a personal perspective, as somebody who lives and works in Orkney, I work as a, a farmer, that's my kind of part-time job at weekends, I'm becoming increasingly aware of the more volatile weather patterns being experienced um, as, a, a, as a result of climate change. I, I was just reliably informed uh, recently that in the months of December and January that have just passed, we had approximately 10 inches of rainfall in each of those two months, whereas um, normally we would expect something like three or four inches. And you can certainly see that uh, from the ground conditions. Whereas last summer, we had a, a, a bumper crop as far as uh, crops were concerned. Really good summer, much warmer than we'd normally get. So I think this whole issue of warmer and wetter is certainly, you know, it's over a period of time, it's certainly something we're beginning to see, certainly from a farming point of view. On a different point, and please forgive me if I do mention Orkney a little bit, but I do come from there, so I, I know it better than any of the other, uh, other local authority areas, so I, I will use it a little bit in, in what I said today. Orkney ha 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 becomes a focal point for many of Scotland's efforts at trialling and testing low carbon infrastructure solutions. And I'm seeing firsthand many of the renewable energy generation technologies which will help us in our efforts to reduce uh, carbon emissions, to limit global temperature rises, and to hence mitigate the long-term effects of climate change. Orkney has the, the home of EMEC, the European Marine Energy Centre for Wave and Tidal Power genera Generators. And while development in this, these particular sectors is maybe not as quick as we would have liked, it is only with concerted testing in appropriate places with the, with the conditions, that, uh, the, the appropriate conditions that solutions are going to be found. So I think short-term investment will have long-term results, and so it's important that we do remain focused on these long-term uh, gains. Wind turbines and, believe it or not, solar panels are increasingly becoming common throughout the islands as we seek to maximise our ability to use re renewable res uh, sources to generate the power that we need whilst keeping carbon emissions to a minimum. In fact, in 2013, which has it's already been alluded to, Orkney produced more energy from renewable sources than the islands could consume. So achieving the uh, Scottish Government's aim of a low-carbon Scotland will require concerted efforts ranging from smaller individual behaviour changes to large-scale strategically um, driven infrastructure projects. It cannot be done by any one group in isolation and requires partners working across the public and private sectors, also including third sector organisations, communities, local and national government as well. And I'm pleased to see that this approach has, is already in place, and I do applaud, applaud a lot of the really good work that has been done to date. So I want to talk to you today about the role that local government plays in helping to achieve the carbon reduction targets and the ways in which we can work at both a community level and at a national strategic level. As I say, some excellent projects have already been implemented, and I look forward to the creative solutions that are yet to be developed, because they are being developed regularly. We're hearing of some really good uh, developments taking place. So if we look at the big picture, Scotland reacted quickly and decisively to the threat of climate change, setting statutory carbon emission targets over the period to 2050, 
and requiring public bodies to uh, embed climate change and sustainability issues into their activities and their objectives. The National Strategy for Achieving the Carbon Reduction Targets is set out in the Scottish Government's Report on Policies and Proposals, SPP2. And work is about to begin on the third edition of this report, building on the policies and proposals already in place and identifying the next phase of work that's got to be done. At COSA, we are very keen that this third edition uh, has a dual focus that both sets a national framework and identifies priorities whilst at the same time enabling local authorities to take decisions that affect their communities at a local level. We believe that decisions which have an impact on communities properly need to be taken at the local authority level. And whilst this may result in different solutions being implemented across Scotland, this is a reflection of the, really, of the very real difference in local priorities and circumstances and is an illustration of the necessary uh, complexities of addressing the transition to a low carbon uh, society. And this is the great strength of our system of local government, our ability to tailor approaches to local needs and so address local issues within the context of national objectives. Very often that will mean local authorities working together, learning from each other, sharing best practices. These are all important aspects of this. But localism is something, certainly as far as cause is concerned, that we're, it's very precious to us. The key themes of the report, transport, energy, rural landscape, waste, homes and communities and business, industrial processes and the public sector, all have components where local authorities can play their part. And I want to talk a, a little bit more in detail about the projects and approaches where we, where we can actually make a difference. So we're looking at our local authority perspective. Leadership is very important when making such large scale changes across society. And I'm pleased to serve as Vice Chair of the Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum, where we regularly debate the ways in which we in the public sector can both show personal leadership and help to identify and implement carbon reduction projects within our communities and organisations. Of course, as well as my public roles, I'm, like everybody else, I'm a user of council services and I'm a farmer. And in all that I do, I'm very aware of the delicate balance between climate, the natural and built environment, communities and the delivery of public services. Leadership at this personal level is also very important. Local authorities have been demonstrating leadership in the area of climate change for several years, with all 32 Scottish local authorities signing up to the Scottish Climate Change Declaration and voluntarily submitting reports each year, setting out the actions they are taking to combat climate change and to develop low carbon solutions in their area. I think we've been doing these for six years now. I was the leader of the council in Orkney when we started it. And from the very start, all 32 councils signed up immediately to this. And I think that showed good leadership from local authorities. So I'm proud of that leadership that we have shown. And I commend our, my fellow councillors and our officers in our councils for the hard work, for their insight, and for the innovative approach that they've taken uh, to this. We're now moving to mandatory reporting, which is something that's been advocated by the Scottish Government. And I would encourage all pub public sector bodies to remain uh, targeted on the desired outputs, which are lowered uh, carbon emissions, rather than a narrow focus on completing reports. It's the changed behaviours and actions that are recorded in, this, in these reports that make the difference. It's not actually the reports themselves. So what sort of successes have we had to date? Well, councils across Scotland are showing substantial year-on-year -year reductions in carbon emissions. They're doing this through actions aimed at both managing their own activities um, and in encouraging and helping communities to adopt low carbon lifestyles. And as they are doing this, with, they are doing it with a range of partners, such as power generation companies, waste management organisations and third sector groups. It's also worth pointing out that a critical uh, component of the success is uh, ensuring cross-departmental working and coordination to make sure that the impact of individual projects is fully understood across the entire council organisation and that all groups involved play the parts that are required of them. It doesn't take much imagination to see that this cross-sector integrated approach is also necessary at an external level as well. Just last month, the SCCD reports were published and they demonstrated an ongoing commitment and achievement of all Scottish local authorities. 
From recent reports, we can see that councils are generally demonstrating year-on-year -year reductions in carbon emissions. In Orkney, for example, the council reduced carbon emissions from its estate by 21 per cent uh, between 2005 and 2012. And this has been done through clearly focusing on council activities, building management and individual behaviours and identifying a number of areas where action can be taken. And as I say, we're not alone in this in Orkney. All, all 32 councils can demonstrate the improvements that they have made and you can see those can be seen in the set of reports that have just been published. Electric vehicles have been alluded to, and I was just going to say a little, about, a little bit about electric vehicles as parts of council's fleets, because they're now becoming more and more widespread. I think that four of the top five UK councils have now adopt, who have adopted electric vehicles are actually in Scotland. And in addition, there are a number of projects running which aim to encourage local inhabitants to switch to electric vehicles through the installation of charging points at uh, strategic locations and the development of vehicle sharing neighbourhood schemes. This is very much a, a developing industry which is attracting more and more attention um, but uh, as performance of vehicles improve and the costs decrease. And I suppose in the end of the day the cost will have to de decrease to, to a level where people can actually afford it. Perhaps councils are taking, are taking the risk because maybe they have more money to do that, although in, in these days uh, money is quite tight in councils as well. But I think councils are, are wanting to show an example and that's, that's why they have, sorry, uh, they have been um, buying in these electric vehicles. But I think if we can get the costs to come down, I think more and more private people will, will start to use them. And of course, in the Orkney context, you can see that when you've got small distances to travel, electric vehicles are actually very suitable. Energy efficient street lighting has been rolled out across Scotland through partnership working involving Scottish Futures Trust, Resource Efficient Scotland, Scotland Excel, Scots, local authorities and COSLA, an awful lot of partners there. Scotland's local authorities have now planned investment of more than £100 million uh, pounds to 2018 in making their street lights more energy efficient. This investment will upgrade 45% upgrade of the street lights in Scotland and will uh, produce savings of at least £13.4 million pounds per annum in electricity and carbon reduction uh, uh, commitment costs and more than 56,000 tonnes of CO2. It's not just with regards to directly attributable emissions that councils are making a difference. They're also developing schemes to address area-wide emissions too. So by working in partnership with city agencies, housing associations, energy providers and third-party contractors, councils are developing district heating schemes for high and low-rise blocks, which combined with external cladding insulation and energy-efficient appliances are expected to significantly reduce both the number of households in fuel poverty and carbon emissions. Glasgow's scheme for the energy-efficient retrofit of housing association stock, for example, is expected to reduce carbon emissions by around 25k tonnes uh, per year. So what are the future challenges for us? I think our ongoing challenge is to continue to build on our successes to date and to continue to explore new ways of further reducing uh, carbon emissions through behaviour change and technological innovation. I fear that if we don't continue to keep a strong and unwavering focus on continually reducing uh, uh, emissions, progress made to date will stall and all the hard work invested so far may become worthless. One specific area of concern is the need to strengthen the electricity grid in order to allow better, transmi uh, better transmission and distribution of energy generated from renewable resources to the places where it is most needed. And as I mentioned earlier on, Orkney has the ability to generate more el electricity than it needs from renewable sources. However, limitations with the grid means that we cannot export this electricity and indeed at times we have to switch off the sources, the renewable sources due to the restrictions, restrictions within the island grid. So much of the time there are wind turbines that are not turning around because they cannot export what they're producing. So tackling this great issue, unsurpri unsurprisingly, will also require collaboration and partnership across a range of bodies together with strong leadership at a national level, and so very much at a national level with this particular one. This is just one area that needs to be addressed if we are to achieve our aims of reducing Scotland's carbon emissions by 42% by 2020. Transport, energy efficiency 
and the decarbonisation of heat are just some of the other themes that we need to think about. But what is clear is that across all of the themes identified in our RPP2, bold, innovative and challenging solutions are required in order to meet the targets. The only way in which this can be done is by bringing together scientists and policymakers, communities and employers, local and national government, educational establishments and industry, and working together to implement the large and small changes that are required. Whilst meeting climate change uh, targets is undoubtedly a large problem, it is by no means an un unsolvable problem. The key is to fully think through the implications of any policy intervention or infrastructure change and understand how to manage and to, uh, to mitigate these implications in order to achieve the desired outcome. Instead of thinking that will never work, we need to focus on how can we make this work. And that requires us to continue the partnership and collaboration approach which we have already begun, building on it to an even greater extent and together achieving our goals. Thank you very much.